Welcome to Imagine Otherwise, the podcast about the people and projects bridging art, activism, and academia to build better worlds. Episodes offer in-depth interviews with creators who use culture for social justice and explore the nitty-gritty work of imagining otherwise. I'm your host, Kathy Hanneback. This is episode 95, and my guest today is Anthony Romero. Anthony is an artist, writer, and organizer committed to documenting and supporting artists and communities of color. His solo and collaborative works have been performed and executed internationally. He's a co-founder of the Latinx Artists Retreat, as well as the Latinx Artist Visibility Award, built in collaboration with Jay Soto and Oxbow School of Art. Anthony is a professor of the practice at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts at Tufts University, as well as a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. In our interview, Anthony and I talk about bringing socially engaged art into the classroom, the politics of building Latinx artist retreats within and beyond institutions, and why intervening in the sonic color line is a key part of how Anthony imagines otherwise. Thanks so much for being with us today, Anthony. Thank you for having me. So much of your work focuses on the critical possibilities of socially engaged art or art that's rooted in and responsive to social justice movements. What draws you to this way of approaching aesthetics? And maybe conversely, what do you see art as bringing to social justice movements? I, like a lot of folks, can be preoccupied with questions of utility in art. So that being what what is the art doing? And I think that's why that's in part why I, I naturally gravitated towards performance, which is kind of my primary medium. It's also what I teach at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. And for me, performance is about the doing of something, right? So what do things do in the world? What kinds of effects do they have? And how are those effects consolidated to form impressions of things? So in class, for example, while we might talk about the doing of things and what the what sort of effects we want our work to have on and in the world, you know, both in the sense of like to move the realities that we inhabit currently, but also to produce or sort of speculate on alternative realities. In the classroom, we're we're simultaneously thinking about that as well as materials and forms. For me, these things, they, they come together in the sense that like in the case of painting, for example, we can think about the paint and the canvas as the material, and we can think about the painting as the form. Similarly, in ceramics, we would think about the clay as the material and the form as the vessel or the sculpture. And for me, that idea in regards to to other forms of art, which are socially engaged art specifically, really gets extended by thinking about how policy can be a kind of material, how urban development can be a material, and how that might change the form of a city, for example. So when I think about these kinds of critical possibilities of socially engaged art, I think that in part we are translating our creative imagination to have effects in the world, to do something, right? And to hopefully consolidate those effects in order to create living alternatives. So as a way to explore these issues, I know you're the co-founder of a really fantastic artist retreat, specifically for Latinx artists. First of all, can you give our listeners a little bit of a sense of what that retreat is and what got you excited about creating it? Yeah, so the Latinx Artist Retreat is a self-organized effort which attempts to provide Latinx cultural producers and administrators with a platform to share resources, insights, experiences, knowledge, etc. I became really interested in a project that supported Latinx cultural producers, but that sat adjacent to institutional demands. There's a way in which, you know, in my experience as a Latinx artist, that we are kind of called into institutions in a very piecemeal fashion. You know, we experience a lot of exceptionalism. So while there may be these kind of passing fashions around institutional investment in our communities, you know, they tend to be to to really pigeonhole us around questions of, of, let's say, immigration uh, or, or certain craft traditions, you know, to the exclusion of the many ways that we live our lives in, in intersections of, of gender or race or language or ability or disability, you know, all of these kinds of things. So it's important for me that the project, you know, while it may collaborate with institutions from time to time, that it really be a project which is is sitting adjacent to these kinds of institutions. The project really came to life in Chicago initially is that for me, I was looking at things like the Black Artist Retreat, right, the project that Theaster Gates 
and, and a number of other collaborators were doing for for a few years in which they were inviting you know similarly black cultural producers and administrators to come together and share their experiences etc you know by by contrast we are uh, you know to the kind of class accessibility and the wealth of resources that an artist you know a kind of mega artist like theaster gates has we're really much more of a grassroots effort so we need to partner with institutions but my hopes is that we're able to do that in ethical fashion which allows us to maintain control over the platform um, so it's kind of a it's kind of a complicated dance but for me it's important that we are self-organizing this effort and that we are being responsive to the communities that we are a part of I know in a lot of the work that you do at the retreat with your with your collaborators, you really do emphasize the importance of an expansive understanding of the Latinx diaspora. And it's baked into kind of how you structure the retreat. And I'm curious about that process. Why was that such an important mission for you and your collaborators? And how does that show up in some of the projects and the, the structures that you produce? It's a complicated question for me, which I think is in part answered by by revealing some tidbits of my personal history, right? So I have a working class background. I'm from a small rural town in the hill countries of Texas. My family is, has lived in Texas for a couple of generations now, and they have a relationship to to this kind of working class experience, both in terms of what they did professionally, but also in terms of uh, of what their parents did, for example, right? So one thing that I've been talking with my parents a lot about is that, you know, my parents both started working in the fields, picking cotton when they were very small. You know, my father started when he was seven and, and my mother similarly started as a child. And this was a way for them to easily put some food on the table or to buy school supplies or to help kind of support their families. Now, it's amazing the strides that my parents were able to make coming from that situation to, you know, owning their house and my father having a small business and AC repair and being able to have a child like myself who goes on to graduate school, who then becomes a professor at a university. You know, there are these these leaps. But for us, that experience of brownness is so particular to the geography of not only the borderlands, but of Texas specifically, right? And it's really kind of rooted in a Mexican origin experience, right? So all of those things that I detailed around, you know, working in the fields, picking up cotton, those all have implications in terms of language and in terms of culture that's being produced, you know, in terms of knowledges that are being spread, informal social networks, all that kind of stuff, right? It's all rooted in the ground. And especially in a place like Texas, which was formerly Mexico, that experience is so is so specific to me and to the experience of lots of Mexican origin folks in the borderlands that as I traveled for graduate school to a place like Chicago, for example, and then to Philadelphia and now to Boston, I think I have for many years now been trying to understand the diversity of the brown experience, you know, and, and of what it is to articulate something about our commonalities as Latinx peoples. Like this morning, I was thinking about it almost as a kind of hemispheric sensibility. Is there a way in which we could, you know, unite ourselves, build solidarity, build coalitions and collectivities across the breadth of our experiences, right? Which, you know, are certainly rooted in the things which make up so much of my own personal history, but are also deeply rooted in, in indigenous histories of genocide and displacement of, you know, obviously of, of mass migration and, and forced migration and violence and imperialism and colonialism and all of this kind of stuff, which articulates and refines almost each of our experiences across the hemisphere in very unique and specific ways. But we are still, you know, essentialized within dominant culture inside of the U.S. And so is there some part of that that is able to be mobilized in order to affect some kind of political change? It's almost a question of, to think of Guayachi Spivak's idea of strategic essentialism. You know, I, I don't think that I would go that far in terms of a project like the retreat, but certainly something that's on my mind across a lot of my work in regards to Latinx experience is really kind of this question of like, what are we, how do we describe and articulate ourselves as a people, which can sometimes register on an affective level, like in the room of the retreat, I feel some forms of kinship or collectivity or community build up inside of those relationships. Now, I can't totally articulate or intellectualize about that, you know, or, or become slippery to do so because 
to put language on it is already to allow it to slip away, right? Because I recognize the contradictions and the paradoxes inside of all of that. And as much as I recognize, you know, what some sort of common feeling being built in those relationships, I also recognize that there's a great deal of difference. I'm thinking about that a lot in Boston, certainly, you know, in Boston, you know, among Spanish speaking peoples, high Caribbean populations, you know, a lot of Central Americans and in each of those communities is really so different from the kinds of like Mexican centered experiences that I had growing up. You mentioned Boston. Can we talk about your fabulous new fellowship position a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in the fall, I'll start as a Radcliffe fellow at the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard, which I'm pretty excited about. Congratulations, first of all. Thank you. What are you hoping to work on during that fellowship? Yeah, so for the fellowship, I'll be continuing a strain of research, which I started, I guess, a little more a year ago, and and is kind of being built in collaboration with artists Matthew Joint and Josh Rios, both of whom are in Chicago, and with whom I've developed a a kind of series of projects out of this line of thinking. You know, for me, the, the research is rooted in thinking about the criminalizing of indigenous sound and music practices across, you know, particularly the English colonies. So thinking about the ways in in which in South Asia, English colonizers institute a number of laws which are meant to disband collective displays of prayer, which tend to be rooted in in sound experiences, right, of of vocalizing or playing drums or instruments or this kind of thing. And the logic is that, you know, you want to disband these groups because you can't have groups of oppressed peoples gather together for fear of inciting some kind of revolution. But to disband that collective display of reverie is to not only shift the sonic landscape of those people, you know, ir- irreversibly, but is also also to fundamentally alter the, the worldview of that population, right? It's to fundamentally change their faith and their belief systems. And so for me, there are these kind of interlocking logics of dispersal and repression, which manifest themselves in the sonic realm. Part of the research is thinking about how are those colonial practices of criminalization, so how do they sow the seeds for the contemporary over-policing of communities of color through things like nuisance laws, right? Like sound ordinances, for example. And how does you know, the the designation of noise, for example, become justification for the killing or um, arresting and incarcerating of people of color. The kind of micro version of it would be calling the cops on your neighbor because they're they're being too loud. Or, Or, for example, in Philly, one of the things that, you know, one of the ways you can see this play out is that in West Philly, for example, you might have lots of black neighbors who are having lots of block parties and as those neighborhoods start to shift demographically through gentrification or the expansion of universities and more you know, young white folks move into those neighborhoods, then you have these instances where like, these young white folks are now calling the cops on their black neighbors who maybe have been having these block parties for years and years. And now you know, you're instigating this kind of conflict between these communities of color and state-sanctioned violence. Jennifer Lynn Stover wrote, is an author, and she wrote this book called The Sonic Color Line. And one of the things that she talks about in the book is that silence is not accessible on either end for communities of color, right? Like to be silent. So, for example, to be detained by the police and to be silent is seen as an act of aggression. And to not be silent is also seen as an act of aggression. So there's this way in which you are constrained both by silence as much as by noise. And in many ways, this is such a great this project, but also your work more broadly, is is such a great example of what kind of really exciting work can happen when you bring together academia, art, and activism. I mean, in many ways, your your career is the embodiment of these things braiding together. And this is something I talk about with all the guests on the show, and is at the kind of premise of this. Um, what gets you excited about bringing those three realms together? Because not everybody does, and maybe not everybody needs to. That's perfectly fine. But I find such I find the richest projects sit at the intersection of these. Yeah, I you know I don't think that I do it intentionally. I think that I am a very studious and academic person. That there's a certain there's a certain way of articulating ideas that we define as as academia or the academy, and I gravitate towards that 
kind of language use and, and that way of stringing ideas together. I don't know that I would think of myself as a activist. That's that's a word that I have a complicated relationship to. But I certainly do think of my work as being very collaborative. You know, very often my work involves collaborating with activists. Um, so So maybe there a kind of distinction is that my work is really centered on the artistic experience, which sometimes includes working towards institutional change, you know, but both in terms of my university, sitting on committees, things like that, but also in terms of uh, invitations from institutions and wanting to stretch those institutions to, to be more inclusive, to be more equitable. You know, that's certainly something that I've written a lot about. But I'm also someone that feels like the symbolic world can still have real effects, right? That it can still do something. So I think it's, it's you know, that all of those things get braided together, that kind of collaborative impulse, this belief in what art can do in the world and my dedication to it and the discipline that I bring to that practice. And then this, you know, one particular way of, of braiding ideas together. And I think for me, it's it's all, I think of it all as a kind of form of study. One thing that I felt like I was quoting very often is this moment from the Undercommons by Fred Moten and Stefano Harney, in which they describe their use of the word study as being that which you do with other people. So for them, playing in a band is a form of study. Sitting on a porch and talking with people is a form of study. You know, anything that we could we could think of as being a kind of social occasion constitutes a form of study. And I think that's that's it for me. You know, I, I want to understand the world and I, I want to have an effect on that world. And I want to create platforms that gives agency to other people to do the same. This brings me, I think, very nicely to my final question, which gets at that making it better, that world that you're working towards when you collaborate with all of the the fellow folks that you produce work with, when you teach your students, when you create your art, when you organize retreats and and collective experiences. So I'll ask you this giant question that I really like closing (laughs) out each episode with, um, because it gets at the kind of why behind all of the work that you do. So what kind of world do you want? You know, I think more than anything, I want people to have the freedom to access the world fully for themselves. Perhaps another way to say it is that self-determination and self-liberation are at the heart of the kind of world that I want to see. You know, that I want the people that I love to love and be loved in the world and and to not fear for their lives all the time. You know, I, I think that's maybe the larger way of saying it. And then the smaller way would just be like, I I want to live in a world where people who look like me and my son are locked in cages and forcibly medicated and detained forever without end. It's all kind of a way of understanding the world and in understanding that world, figuring out how we might make it better. Well, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing all of the ways that you create and imagine otherwise. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to another episode of Imagine Otherwise. Imagine Otherwise is produced by Ideas on Fire, and this episode was created by Christopher Prasad and myself, Kathy Hanneback. You can check out the show notes for this episode on our website at ideasonfire.net, where you can also read about our fabulous guests, as well as find links to the people and projects we discussed on the show.